Welcome to the Pan Am Podcast, brought to you by the Pan Am Museum in Garden City, New York. This podcast and our museum are dedicated to celebrating the legacy of the world's most iconic airline, Pan American World Airways. My name is Tom Betty, and I'm the host of this program. Thank you for joining us. The Pan Am Museum Foundation is a nonprofit organization. Please visit our website for more information at thepanammuseum.org. Again, our website is thepanammuseum.org. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok. If you are using Apple Podcasts, please consider leaving a review. It will help others discover this program. This podcast is sponsored by the generous personal support of Mr. Adam Aaron, the CEO and chairman of AMC Theaters. He is also president of our sister organization, the Pan Am Historical Foundation. If you're not familiar with Pan Am, welcome. We are honored to have you here and for you to learn about what we're all about. If you already know of Pan Am, worked for or flown on the airline, or just love our history, it's good to be with you again. So with that, let's get this episode in the air, so to speak. Welcome aboard your Pan American Jet Clipper. In this episode, we'll be exploring the incredible life of Pan Am Captain Robert Ford, a trailblazing flying boat aviator that found international fame with an unscheduled flight round the globe. And we welcome back to the program Pan Am 747 Captain John Marshall that knew Pan Am legend Captain Robert Ford and recorded an interview with him in 1994, shortly before he died. Excerpts of this rare interview will be played, and you will get to hear the actual voice of Captain Ford talking about his aviation career in the late 1920s, 1930s, and 1940s. In December of 1941, Captain Ford was ferrying mail and passengers from San Francisco to New Zealand aboard a Pan Am Boeing 314 flying boat named the Pacific Clipper. On December 7, 1941, Japanese forces attacked Pearl Harbor, and Captain Ford was ordered to evade the enemy and prevent the Japanese from capturing the aircraft for its technology. Skirting the trouble zone and watching for enemy aircraft, he headed the flying boat west over Australia, India, and Central Africa, then crossed to South America, eventually making a safe landing at the Marine Air Terminal at what is now LaGuardia Airport in New York on January 6, 1942. The entire trip covered 31,500 miles in 209.5 hours of flying time, some of it over war territory. The Clipper had a range of 4,500 miles, and its longest single flight was 3,583 miles across the South Atlantic from Central Africa to Brazil. Captain Ford, who was then 35 at the time, called his round-the-world flight a purely routine operation. Let's listen to a three-and-a-half-minute clip from a 1945 Pan Am corporate film depicting the beginning of Captain Ford's trek around the globe as a world war broke out. Please note that this was dramatized for effect. Thing was clock-like. The captain was at the controls. The engineer was making a log entry. The navigator was checking the course. Out of the stillness came the ship's call letters. Some routine message, doubtless. The date was December 7th, 1941. The secret message read simply Plan A, but its meaning was electrifying. This one word and one letter message meant that war had come to the Pacific. The captain summoned the chief steward to the flight deck. Black out the windows, wake everybody up, and get them together on the lounge. Pan American was ready. Flight and ground crews all knew their war jobs. First, they must get this clipper and its passengers out of the way of the enemy. 
Pick up anything you can, but don't send anything. The Japs are still out there. Give me another thousand horsepower. We've got to get away from here fast. The captain and navigator plotted a new course. It was away from the known clipper routes. It accorded with plan A. Quickly, the clipper was blacked out. Running lights were turned off. The navigator by now had determined his course and gave data to the first officer. He adjusted the automatic pilot, turned the clipper toward a secret destination. It had all happened in minutes. The passengers gathered sleepy and bewildered. Sorry we had to get you up, but I have some very serious news. The Japs have just bombed Pearl Harbor. We are at war. But every man in this crew knows his war job, knows what to do, so don't be alarmed. We will take every measure for your protection. The Clipper has changed its course, and we are now heading for a safe port. War had exploded over the entire world. Every Pan American route was now a war route. The Clipper ships and the men who flew them were instantly at our country's service. From our nation's capital, while the explosions of Jap bombs were still echoing, Pan American Airways received its first orders from the Army. The company already had been fighting a commercial battle with the Axis for two years. Now came all-out war. The Navy also had urgent work for Pan American to do. Its globe-covering routes and 25,000 men and women were now a vital part of our country's war machine. Over the wires went an order to all Pan American's divisions. It was the now famous All Facilities Order, changing the Clippers of Peace to Clippers at War. The entire 90,000 mile system of Pan American Airways enlisted. Let's listen to another short clip, this time from radio personality Orson Welles from his popular radio program in 1942. It should be noted that following the attacks on Pearl Harbor, tensions and public anxiety were high and national morale was low. The story of Captain Ford's flight was a much-needed boost to the American psyche after it was suddenly plunged into a world war. Again, note that the radio chatter was dramatized for effect. It's a cold morning of January 6, 1942, in the glass wall control room at LaGuardia Field, New York. Pacific Clipper inbound from Auckland, New Zealand. Captain Ford reporting. You arrive, Pan American Marine Terminal, seven minutes. And seven minutes later, 14 men stepped from the plane into the bitter dawn wearing summer clothes. Tropical shorts. Yes, sir. 31,500 miles in 34 days. All the way around the globe to avoid the enemy. Never mind asking if those men dressed in Singapore shorts didn't feel a little silly as they sat shivering in a New York taxi. Never mind asking about the radio officer Poindexter. Told his wife to hold dinner for him in San Francisco on the night of December 2nd. A dinner that waited cold on the table for 31,500 miles. 34 days. Never mind, because we're talking about voyages. Man's passage through space and time. Now on to our interview with Pan Am 747 Captain John Marshall with clips from his 1994 interview with Captain Robert Ford shortly before his death. Born in Cambridge, Massachusetts, Captain Robert Ford earned his wings as a naval aviator before joining Pan American Airways in 1933. He flew Pan Am's routes in Central and South America as well as the Caribbean before transferring to the Atlantic Division in 1939, flying clippers between New York and Lisbon. He shifted to the Pacific route in July of 1941. Before his round-the-globe journey, he had completed some 50 flights across the two oceans. After retiring in 1952 from Pan Am, 
Captain Ford became a cattle rancher in Penn Valley, California, north of Sacramento. He died in October of 1994 at the age of 88. Captain Marshall, thank you very much for coming back onto the Panium podcast. Thanks very much, Tom. Very happy to be here. And we have a special treat for our listeners. 30 years ago in 1994, just before Robert Ford passed away, you had the opportunity and good fortune to interview him and you recorded it. Yes, I was very, very fortunate to be able to make contact with Bob Ford. Shortly after I went to work for Pan Am in, in 1964, I became aware of this story, this incredible story of Bob Ford boards around the world flight that became part of Pan Am lore. And it turned out to be an incredible flight and the the longest commercial uh, aircraft flight in the world up until that time and for some time uh, long after. And the more I looked into the history of this flight, the more intrigued I got. And I thought I would like to do an article about it. And when I began my research, I discovered that of all the members of the crew, there were 10 uh, members of the flight crew, of all those crew members, the only one that I could track down that was still with it uh, was the captain, Bob Ford. Uh, Bob was 88 years old. He had terminal cancer, and he was totally deaf in both ears. And he lived with his delightful wife, Betty, at a ranch at the end of a long dirt road uh, in Northern California. Well, I negotiated an interview with him on the phone with his wife. We agreed that I would drive up one Saturday and have lunch, and uh, I would have an opportunity to talk to Captain Ford. Well, I flew to Sacramento, rented a car, and drove up north and Uh, The Fords lived at the end of about a 30-mile dirt road with a lovely ranch, beautiful ranch house, and they welcomed me very generously, gave me lunch, and I spent a good part of the rest of the morning and most of the afternoon and through lunch talking to Bob Ford. And he talked about his early life uh, in the Army Air Corps and then with flying with the Navy and his early days at Pan Am and then He talked about this incredible flight that occurred after the Japanese had bombed Pearl Harbor and Bob's command, which was the Pacific Clipper, a Boeing 314 flying boat, was caught in Auckland, New Zealand, on the wrong side of the Pacific after the war had started. And after sitting in New Zealand for over a week, they were instructed by Pan Am in New York to return the airplane to the United States westbound, delivered to Pan Am's Marine Air Terminal at LaGuardia, New York, uh, via the most expeditious means possible, which meant flying westbound uh, the long way around the world. From a military history standpoint, that was a real pivotal moment in the American psyche at the time that this was kind of like the first victory of World War II because American morale was was depleted after Pearl Harbor and a lot of Americans were really scared about what was coming next. This was just a great story. Orson Welles covered it on his radio program and it was just a great story for the American public. Yeah, they, it was a daunting proposition for them because none of the crew members had ever been in that part of the world before. They had no maps, no charts. They had little or no money. They ended up uh, going to the local schools in Auckland and copying maps out of schoolboy atlases, <laughs> which is what they, uh, part of the time, that's all they had to use for navigation. Wow. And it was a tribute to Rod Brown, who was the navigator, that he was able to navigate that airplane across trackless oceans and deserts and jungles all the way back to, to the United States. It was a tremendous, it was an incredible feat. So uh, I spent, as I said, uh, a good part of the day with the Fords and got a wonderful interview with Captain Ford. And uh, the piece that I wrote was published by Smithsonian Air and Space Magazine shortly before Captain Ford passed away. He wrote me a couple of very nice letters after our interview. And... uh, 
he was able to see the the finished product in the magazine before he died and he told me that he liked it so and then i subsequently did a piece for airways magazine uh, later on and i've given a couple of presentations since about it since it was such an incredible feat a lot of people say you know you shouldn't meet your heroes because you'll be disappointed but it sounds like you were able to meet your hero and it met and exceeded all of your expectations. Can you share a little bit of your personal journey here? Yeah, I, um, yeah, of course, I knew that Ford was one of the early Pan Am pilots and that he had an earlier career on the military with the Army Air Corps and also with the Navy. In fact, when he went through pilot training in the, the Army Air Corps at Randolph Field in San Antonio, his flight instructor was Claire Chenault, who ended up being rather famous or infamous, depending on how you look at it, as the leader of the uh, American Volunteer Group, better known as the Flying Tigers, in China shortly after the start of the war. Interesting. So, yeah. And so he had uh, uh, a real connection to history, to aviation history, not only with Pan Am, but with the military before that. And we have a couple clips to share. Uh, let me go ahead and play the first one. Let's take a listen to a three and a half minute clip of Robert Ford talking about when he started his aviation career, when he joined the Army Air Corps in Boston in the spring of 1928. And, uh, I might as well give you the whole enchilada. I read an ad in the Boston newspaper in the spring of 28. The adjutant general, the U.S. Army, they wanted people with certain educational qualifications to apply to be flying cadets in the Army Air Corps. Well, I thought that was a good idea. I heard that on Pan American that they required these other things, the mechanics, the radio, the pilots, and the so I went to the Boston Radio School down at the Custom House, and that I had a, a hassle. When I took the exam for the second class license, open to the public, on my exam, the examiner objected to my drawing tandem transmitting tubes and the, the diagram of a belt transmitter. Well, he said, no, there weren't any such thing. So I had to take the subway back to Cambridge and the streetcar and all the rest of it through my parents' home. <laughs> got, got the book. Oh, yeah. Brought it and yeah. showed it to me. Well, now I had the license. So then, uh, that mechanics license, if Joe Bela's thing wouldn't cover all the stuff you had to know to have an A and an E. The only thing I had was a Pratt & Whitney wasp engine overhaul manual. And I didn't realize I had the capability, but I memorized it. <laughs> I didn't realize I was doing that. My God. But in the written examination for the mechanics license, it says, give in detail the overhaul of the Pratt & Whitney Wasp engine. Oh, my God. So you were set. <laughs> I just wrote it all out. The examiner looked at me. <laughs> he said, if it weren't for the fact that I sat here all the time, I think you took it out of the book. <laughs> Then it came to the physical exam, and I was told to report to the uh, Air National Guard flight surgeon at Boston Airport. <clears throat> so I did, and I took the exam, and I got all through, and he said, well, you passed a very good examination, except, he said, your eyes will never let you fly. Well, I thought that was a bunch of baloney. I never had any eye trouble. I didn't wear glasses or anything. So I went to the best eye specialist in Boston. He refracted my eyes. He wouldn't even uh, put the drops in them to bring them back after after the refraction. He made me wait three days. Now he said, I want you to go back to that flight surgeon and tell him that I said that your eyes were nearly perfect. <laughs> so I went back to this guy. I told him, I've been to Dr. Edwin Jack, and he told me that he wanted me to tell you that my eyes were nearly perfect. He reached up, he pulled out a folder, signed his name in three places, and I was on my way and you were to home San free. Antonio. <laughs> now, can you imagine that? Yeah. I mean, 
That's fumble bumble. Yeah. So it's been 30 years since you heard that. What's going through your mind? <laughs> I, I, I'm just, um, first, first of all, it's mind boggling that uh, someone would memorize a Pratt and Whitney engine overhaul manual in uh, the first place. Uh, and the second thing that comes to mind that that it, it's something that could never happen today. I don't think we mm-hmm. would ever find anyone with the with the ambition and the guts and the fortitude and the and the drive to do that. To, mm-hmm. uh, it was an extraordinary thing. I was I was amazed when I heard what he had to say about that. <laughs> it's still incredible for me to hear an 88 year old from 1994 talking about things in such clarity that happened in 1928 well i know the guy was so sharp it it was amazing and i'd like to thank you for sharing this with uh, all of our listeners because that this is an incredible gift that we get to share for future generations to explore this time period right should we listen to another clip sure all right so here's another three and a half minute clip of bob ford talking about his air corps training in the summer of 1928 in san antonio texas well i got there in in july of 28 i saw it right away were you buying jenny's no it's like consolidated PC3s, PT1s. They had a few cheap PT1s with histo engines. Yeah. But the others had the right wheel ones. Every day the mechanics would roll out a, a plane for me and I'd go out and fly around that part of Texas. Yeah. The other guys had a, an instructional on and he was giving him instruction all the time. And I thought that didn't look very well and I was right. This one day along comes a messenger. The message said to report immediately to the final check. <laughs> so <laughs> I reported his name was First Lieutenant Claire Chenault. He'd flown in World War One. Is that right? He looked as though he'd been dragged around the, the track face down on a cinder track. <laughs> Boy, was he scarred up by acne. I'll be darned. Man, he was a nice guy, nice acting. He was a Cajun. So uh, we get in the airplane and get up a couple of thousand feet, spotted a rancher putting asphalt shingles on a brand new, great big hay shed. We gave him the business. (laughs) Shingles were flying. We pulled up again. He came down again. This time the farmer threw a hammer and damn near hit him. Oh, really? It was pretty good. <laughs> and this was supposed to be your check ride? Yeah. Yeah. So we climbed up again high this time, and he did stunts I'd never heard of before, like split asses. And, uh, he never did an inverted loop. I guess he figured the wing structure wasn't good enough. But we did everything else in the book. Yeah. And he made me do it. Well, I get in the spur of the thing, and I had a lot of fun. I'd never even heard of some of these things. He got tired of that, we came down and landed, and he got out and put his arm around my shoulder. Now, this is exact. He said, Ford, there's nothing the matter with your flying. He said, but once these sons of bitches start after you, they'll drive you out of your mind. <laughs> the best advice I can give you is go back and get some extra schooling at the university. And I had four years at Harvard College and, and two more years at the Harvard Engineering School. They get stuff that I didn't have time for when I was in the college. Yeah. And uh, so I took a, another year. He said, you you apply to the uh, Navy or the Marine Corps, you won't have any trouble. Well, I remember primary land plans. My instructor was a Marine Corps warrant Gunner. He was a good, stocky, squat thing. He was an avid baseball fan and ran the baseball team for the, for the whole establishment. He gave me confidence. You know, it kind of shook me up that thing fired right out. 
Yeah. I knew I was up against something. So, anyhow, we got through. What do you think of that clip? <laughs> well, it uh, four years of Harvard College. I mean, he just kind of tossed that out like it was a like a throwaway line. Uh, the, the guy had it, not only incredible uh, intellect to start with and great instincts for flying an airplane. Um, he w- was very well schooled and very knowledgeable about everything about the world around him, and he obviously didn't suffer fools gladly. Uh, he was just quite quite a guy. It was. Uh, it, it was so much fun just sitting there listening to him recount this that happened, my God, 1928, 95 years ago. Uh, yeah, it's incredible. Yeah, it, it was incredible. What else did he talk about that uh, is not part of your recording? Uh, he was interested in... in uh, what I was doing about my career at, at Pan Am, of course, uh, at the time I did this interview, Pan Am had been out of business for several years, and uh, I was on the verge of retirement myself. But he was very interested in in my career and uh, the fact that I had uh, flown in management as a, uh, as a checkerman and as a chief pilot. And uh, he, he, he touched a little bit of, I, I asked him about the rest of his career after we, you know, after the war. Of course, all of the the, um, the boat pilots were subject to immediate enlistment in the U.S. Navy, along with the uh, airplanes, and they were given uh, naval ranks. They were, in all essence, military pilots. It's uh, subject to the needs of the military for the rest of the war. And then after the war, he mentioned that he um, had some issues with uh, Pan Am uh, management uh, in New York. And uh, he left the airline, I think, in the early 50s. Well, let's listen to another clip. Uh, This one is Bob Ford talking about serving in the Atlantic fleet in the summer of 1929 as an aviator in the United States Navy. This clip is about two minutes long. In the summer of 29, I spent uh, 10 months with an Atlantic fleet catapult off a 12-inch gun turret. And uh, they wouldn't let me do it solo. I figured I couldn't do it because I hadn't been to the Naval Academy. But they, weren't, they weren't bad guys at all. Were you in the Navy or the Marine Corps? Navy. Navy. I was over eating dinner over near Langley Field one night across the bay from Norfolk when my squadron finished a tour down in the, through the canal in the Pacific and, and in the Caribbean. And a, a tall guy in a white uniform came up into this intimate interior, which consists of being practically unable to see the, read the menu because of lack of light. <laughs> <laughs> and it was clashing all. He says, hello, Ford, I see you made it. I thought you would. <laughs> So a couple of times, I, in a weekend, I borrowed a squadron plane from another squadron and flew over to, to Langley Field and looked up Claire Chenault. He sat there in his skivvies, his feet in the table, and a gallon jug of sugar whiskey with a couple of charcoal sticks stuck in it to pick up the fusel oil. <laughs> he was Army, was he not? Yeah, yeah. he was Army. Yeah. Now he's a major. I knew something was cooking. Uh, see, it was then he picked up all these graduates of, of uh, the Army, Brooks and Kelly Fields, and, uh, because they, they didn't have money for all of them that got through, and from the Navy from Pensacola. After 30 years, the John Marshall uh, laugh and charisma is still very strong, I must say. <laughs> Uh, what what are some of your thoughts on that particular clip? Well, it's interesting that uh, Claire Chennault, uh had a continuing thread through Bob's life and his career. Chennault, of course, went on to, he became very controversial as the war started. He ruffled a lot of feathers in the upper levels of the military hierarchy, and he ended up 
in China as uh, when he formed the AVG, the American Volunteer Group, which flew the Flying Tigers uh, at the beginning of the war. And he survived the war and went on to, it, it, he had a very illustrious career himself. But, but Ford is just, it's something that just couldn't happen today. He, uh, you know, he started out in, uh, in the Army Air Corps and then went to the Navy and then uh, uh, and then you know, went to work for Pan Am. He had, uh, he had a pretty illustrious career before he ever uh, flew for Pan Am. And what struck me about your interview is he was talking about these aircrafts, these flying boats from the late 1920s, early 1930s in vivid details. And it was just astounding. Yeah. Yeah. His memory was in, uncanny. Yeah. 88 year old guy yeah. uh, talking about uh, these aircrafts like there were it was yesterday. Let's listen to another clip. This clip is about six minutes long, and it's you and uh, Bob Ford uh, talking about what he did after his military service uh, when he joined Pan American in 1933 by calling up Andre Priester to ask for a job after never hearing back from the company the year before. Ford also talks about Pan Am's Western Division operation in Brownsville, Texas, flying the Sikorsky S-38 and S-43 flying boats and trips down to Central and South America in the early 1930s. In uh, May of 33, I lived with my parents in Boston. Of course, the Depression was on full force. Couldn't oh, get, yeah. Couldn't get a yeah. job pumping gas. Yeah. So I was down visiting the in-laws and Fiance says, why don't you call Andre Prusty, who's vice president and chief engineer, and seems to be running that program of expanding the flying force. So uh, I called Prusty on the phone, and it was almost noontime. I didn't expect to get him. It was he who answered the phone. Oh, really? <laughs> you could tell. He told me himself that his, his father was a Dutch provincial governor in Java, and his mother was a Javanese lady. Then he'd get experience in the aviation business as he worked for KLM. Well, I said on the phone, I thought she wanted the pilots who had the licenses and the mechanics licenses and the radio license. He said, I do. I said, well, a year ago I applied. Other people have gotten jobs. I didn't get a job. He says, where are you? <laughs> I said, I'm over in New Jersey. He said, how long did it take you to get here? I said, about 40 minutes. You come right now, he said. <laughs> so I did, and for two hours he talked my head off about all his plans for expanding things and so on. Yeah, and so forth. yeah. Pan Am at that time had two divisions. The western out of Brownsville with Chief Pilot George Craig, who one time had been flying the North Coast Run for some years. They had some trouble over at Brownsville. Uh, and I don't know whether it was personnel or maintenance or what it was. And when I'd fly down as far as the canal zone, huh? they said, well, Hugh Gordon and I were flying together. When we got in and took a shower, we went up to the shooting gallery. He loved to shoot. And we, Machine Clay Bidgets from the assistant airport manager came up to us and said, you better get back and get some sleep. You're going out early in the morning in a, in a 10 to 1 ratio engine, S-38. He said, it hasn't been flown in a year. But he said, they're looking it over right now. Because when we came in, they, uh, you had to pump the gear down and then S-43, he had to pump the gear down by hand mm. and the flap and all the rest of it. They didn't have the parts to repair, but uh, they had to wait till they came from, from Miami. Well, anyhow, we went through the entrance port in Venezuela and the entrance port to Colombia and went up. Now, Medellin, the drug capital of the world, <laughs> didn't have drugs at that time, I guess. At least not for sale. And I'd been there once before, 
there was the crater of a volcano a long time ago, and very wide, and it had filled in with erosion. Mm. So there was a kind of a almost level valley inside there. But you had to get to 10,000 feet to get in there. Oh, wait a minute. You had to get 8,000. Until you get used to it, there was a bit <laughs> frightening. Yeah. You know? yeah. So you're putting your, your head in a noose. Well, we came up to it, there was a solid wall. There was a storm center right over this volcano. There were all these peaks all around it. Well, we fooled around there for about a half an hour. They had no radio waves, nothing. Nothing. They told me that some of the Western Division pilots used to get in there by taking a, a loop bearing on some broadcast station, but there wasn't anything that we knew about. We had nothing in the paperwork they gave us. It required a little local knowledge, huh? <laughs> well, you think when I'd flown it before, they would have given you something. Yeah, sure. That's the way they used to operate. Yeah. So we told them we were coming back, so we went through the clearance vendors with the Columbia and back to the canal zone. Well, then all hell broke loose. Got a letter from Ed Critchley, who was the flight operations manager of Miami, who had us on the, because we were based in Florida, Spain. And he, uh, he said the Western Division has flown this thing for years without any incidents. How come you can't do it? It's real confidence in your pilots. Yeah. Well, I could write a nasty letter too, <laughs> but it was oh so nice. They had a almost a conniption fit. So I decided to call up the <laughs> operations, flight operations manager of the West Division in Brownsville. They wouldn't let me talk to him. I smelled a rat. I kept insisting. Finally, they put him on. He was dead drunk. <laughs> so a couple of things that I want to point out on that clip. He's talking about the Great Depression and how he couldn't even get a job at a gas station uh, to put it in perspective of what was going on in history at the time. And he's talking about flying these flying boats that are, are I don't want to say primitive because that that is putting it in a negative light. But this is the dawn of aviation. What what do you think of that? Well, you know, by today's standards, primitive is probably a an operative word. When you think of the state of the art of navigation aids and the radio equipment that was available at the time and the airplanes that they were flying, it's hard to put it into into the context of, you know, flying today because of the sophistication of what we have today. It's a history lesson to listen to guys like Ford talk about these things. It, uh, yeah, it, mm -hmm. it, Bill Nash was another one that, you know, that flew down there in Central America and they they flew with all these primitive nav aids and and uh, into horrible weather, made up their own approach procedures. Uh, they were pioneers, really. And uh, the, the job had to get done and they just they did it. They found a way to do it. And it's it's really fun to listen to a guy like Ford talk about it like that. Yeah. And also like. Think about what he saw in his life. You know, he went through the Great Depression. He was, he knew people that served in World War One. Yeah. Obviously, everything that happened during World War Two, land planes, jets, the Concorde, the space shuttle, just a, amazing. Yeah, yeah. And he was right at the leading edge of it. And I wonder if, how this world would be if we didn't have these visionary pioneers like Juan Tripp and Bob Ford and uh, Lindbergh and many others, even Steve Jobs and Bill Gates and all of these pioneers and entrepreneurs in business and industry, the space program, like how history would be so different today. It would. It, it wouldn't be the way it is now, that's for sure. I can't thank you enough for allowing us to use these uh, clips from this interview from 1994 
of uh 88 year old robert ford because it's it's such a treat well it's history it it really is so before we get into the long way home and the story of the pacific clipper uh i have one last clip before we get into that story and this clip is bob ford talking about flying the sikorsky s40 flying boats out of dinner key miami and this clip is about four minutes. Let's take a listen. But uh, after I spent about four years down in Florida, Spain, I was transferred to Miami. Apparently they were going to commence flying the Atlantic. And I think Priester asked for me because he remembered you. Mm. But when I got up near New York, uh, for some reason or other, years later, people in the offices there said, why don't you, why don't you go in and visit Ed Christie, who used to be Flight Operations Manager of the Eastern Division. He's the head of the historical department, which was notorious as being a kiss-you-goodbye position. So I went in to see Ed Critchley. You wouldn't believe it. He stood up and shook hands, and he said, of all the pilots that went through Miami, I picked you as the one most likely to succeed. Is that right? <laughs> you wouldn't believe it. What were you flying in Miami? Oh, uh, S S-40s, which was a lumbering. Sikorsky yeah. tail job, mm -hmm. and uh, it took off at 70, it flew at about 75, you approached at 75, and you landed at 70, but it was a good old trundler. Well, you just use it to Nassau under Havana, but I had a, a trip as co-pilot to Bob Fatton, the chief pilot. He'd been a sergeant in the Army. We landed and, uh, and they didn't, we didn't pull up to a buoy and then get winched in. Just one or two engines that kept blubbing the switches. And went into a pretty narrow parking thing for a steam vessel, but pretty big. The fat was notorious for not being a good flying boat operator. And I was out in the bow with the bow boat and the, the bow post up and already Pretty narrow, the wings were sticking over the dog, the two-sided dog. And he was just making too much headway. He didn't, he didn't leave the switch off long enough. So <laughs> there was no headwind or anything in there. It was an enclosed anger. <laughs> See, I think I picked up the bow line and put it on the bow post. But he was going so fast that this bow line was unraveling from slack down on the bottom of the slip and uh, we were in danger of hitting the wingtip on the wall of the hangar. The airport manager was Johnny Donahue. Johnny <laughs> Donahue was a real character. He was notorious for his Spanish, although he was in his Spanish speaking He practically had no Spanish at all. He was notorious for the statement, telephoning some woman who did his laundry and saying, two days and three notches ago, I give you my laundry. <laughs> How come you don't bring it back? <laughs> well, he, he, we used to play ping pong there all the time and, and listen to Don, uh, Donahue. He was a, Johnny, boy, he had a temper. But on this occasion, in front of Donahue, Fat tried to blame me for this narrow squeak. Donahue listened to him for about two minutes, and he interrupted Fat, the chief pilot. He said, what are you talking about? That wasn't Ford. See, you've got to learn how to handle a flying boat. <laughs> the chief pilot he was telling this to. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyhow. So what do you think, Captain Marshall? <laughs> Well, it's interesting that, uh, you know, he, he talks about these characters that, that he flew with. And I've read uh, some other 
uh, memoirs of uh, pilots who were flying about the same time Ford was, and Captain Fat's name uh, came up. Uh, I remember it a couple of times in, in a similar context. He was a chief pilot, and he couldn't fly worth a damn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and But it's so much fun to listen to a guy like Ford reminisce about things like that, that uh, and the way they dock those 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 flying boats, it's just it's incredible that they got away with the stuff that they did. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So let's talk about uh, Pearl Harbor and the Pacific Clipper. Now, for our listeners, uh, it's important to remember that in 1941, the Boeing 314 flying boat and especially the engines were very sought after by the Japanese and the Germans. This is high, high technology, and Pan Am had orders from the U.S. government to prevent this kind of technology to end up in enemy hands uh, as much as possible, even scuttling the aircraft and crashing the aircraft deliberately. Uh, can you give us a little bit more context to the lead up to Pearl Harbor and the Pacific Clipper? Uh, yeah, I'll give you a little uh, a little background. The boy, as you mentioned, Tom, um, the through fourteen, it was a state of the art. It was the most advanced passenger transport uh, of its kind uh, anywhere. If you wanted to fly uh, across the oceans, you flew in a Boeing three fourteen. It was the ultimate in luxury, and it had the right uh, twenty six hundred twin cyclone fourteen cylinder engines that were. Uh, they were, at that time, they were mounted on no other uh, aircraft, civilian or military. And, and uh, so it was a very valuable resource. Um, the 314 was used uh, in scheduled service in the Pacific uh, in 1941, and also across the Atlantic, but the Pacific uh, was the area that we're talking about. And tensions in the Pacific had been running at a very high level for some time because of the actions of the, uh, of the Japanese. And every Pan Am flight that left the West Coast headed across the Pacific, whether they were going to New Zealand or to uh, Manila or China, carried a special packet that was given to the captain on every flight that was a special emergency war plan to only be opened upon direction from headquarters. Well, Ford and his crew left uh, San Francisco on December 1st, 1941. They went to Los Angeles, uh, where they had a brief layover, and then flew to Honolulu. And from there, they went to uh, uh, Canton Island, and then Fiji, and then Noumea, and then to Auckland. And they made they laid over at each uh, spot at each station. And in those days, you landed, and the crew and the passengers got off, and they spent the night. And then the next day, they got back on the airplane and continued on. They were halfway between Noumea and Auckland on the last leg of their flight. It was December eighth, where they were. They had crossed the international date line. It was the morning of December 7th in Honolulu. They were several hours from Auckland when the radio operator received, intercepted an urgent message saying that Pearl Harbor had been bombed by the Japanese. So in blink of an eye, for all purposes, uh, the Pacific Ocean had become a war zone. Ford uh, instituted radio silence from where they were. They continued on to Auckland, landed in Auckland, and it was confirmed that uh, the Japanese had bombed Pearl Harbor and uh, war was expected to be declared momentarily, which it was. So Ford and his crew were there in Auckland with no way to get back to the west coast of the United States by which they come, because the Pacific Ocean was now a war zone. They waited for a week in Auckland, staying at the consulate there, waiting for word from New York. And they were finally they finally received a message saying that they were to attempt to return the flying boat, 
to Boeing 314 Pacific Clipper to New York's LaGuardia Airport by the most expeditious means possible. Well, of course, that meant flying it westbound the long way around, the long way home. <clears throat> they had no maps. They had no charts. They had virtually no money. They copied maps out of schoolboy atlases in Auckland. The emergency war plan, which Ford had opened, had instructed them to paint over any identifying markings, including the name of the airline, uh, the number of the airplane, everything. So when they got the message a week later, they were prepared. They had uh, made sure the airplane was in good running shape. And they took off for Nemea, where they picked up all the Pan Am station personnel there. They were given one hour to pack. They were allowed one suitcase each. And then they headed for Australia, where Ford deposited them uh, for eventual passage back to the United States, probably on some freighter across the South Pacific. But that began uh, the saga of the, the Pacific Clipper. And uh, Bob Ford uh, tells it pretty well in his own words. Well, let's take a listen to you and Bob Ford talking about him flying the Boeing 314 flying boat uh, named the Pacific Clipper from Treasure Island, San Francisco to Honolulu just before Pearl Harbor on December 7th, 1941. And what happened afterward? This clip is about 17 minutes long and Bob's wife also makes an appearance. It was a pleasure listening to the whole thing. Uh, this is just an excerpt. But my one of my favorite parts is Bob Ford, 88 years old, dying of terminal cancer at the time when you interviewed him in 1994, insisting that you have more ice cream. That was my favorite part. <laughs> yeah, I so let's take a listen and then we can talk a little bit more about it. Well, when you left San Francisco, it was before Pearl Harbor. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Did you have any, or had you gotten any briefings or anything about the... Uh... For months. I don't remember how long. Might have been as long as for six months. We had to check out a sealed envelope from security at Treasure Island to open when the Japanese attacked. Not if. Oh, is that right? That's remarkable. Now, I heard some inside stuff from the Navy after the war. Well, now, what was in this secret envelope that right. you uh, endeavored to tell you the route to follow so they had as i found out in route they had obviously been dealing with the royal air force because they treated us with kid gloves provided us with fuel because we came up from new zealand direct to new caledonia to new Year, and uh, gave our people all our employees two hours to get ready and two suitcases to take with them they had to leave behind all the linen, rugs. There were about 20 of them, weren't there, or so? I, f I forgot. I was letting other people worry about that. We flew to Northampton. Is that the name? I can't remember now. I'll think of it a little more. In uh, Australia? In uh, Australia? Gladstone? Yeah. We just flew across the desert from Gladstone to Port Darwin. To Darwin. Oh, I guess we were 100. Flew somewhere around. 100, 200 miles inland from the coast. I think we pretty nearly went over Alice Springs. Did you? Yeah. <laughs> we didn't have any trouble getting fuel. It just that there was one detail that I had overlooked. I had a Cracker Jack crew. My navigator, Rod Brown, who later became chief pilot for American overseas. He was very, very capable. A first engineer and a second engineer. Very, very good. Mm. Reed Riley, the first one, was a genius with reciprocating engines. You didn't really have any charts to navigate with, though, did you? After we left Port Darwin, we had nothing. Yeah, just maps torn out of school books and so on? Don't ever laugh at Bowditch. It took us around the world. Wow. After we left, we made a daylight flight from Port Darwin, sure by a Java. Winding our way after the first couple of hours to a whole bunch of islands and so on and so forth. And we practically went from the southeast tip direct for Surabaya. The Limeys, the uh, Australians, 
poor dogs thought they were giving us a proper recognition signal. They almost shot you down there, didn't they? <laughs> yeah. In fact, the Dutch naval commandant was the first one to greet me when we get in. Because we didn't know where to land or where to go or anything. Mm -hmm. we, we weren't allowed to operate radio at all. Mm -hmm. I never see a cruiser, Navy cruiser in the, in the harbor, but there wasn't room in there, so I landed outside the entrance to the harbor, and it was smooth. And we turn around and head back, talk what looked like official buildings. The rearming boat, instead of coming up to us and giving us a line and towing us or anything like that, stayed off about a mile and waving us on. Finally, when we get up very close to shore, they came up closer. Well, the first person to greet me on the steps of the Naval Commandant's building was a commandant, a Dutchman, talking New York English. He said, it's a lucky thing for you that our air-to-ground radio was working today. He said, it usually doesn't, because our fighters phoned in. He said, well, should we shoot them down? Huh. Well, didn't one of them spot part of the U.S. flag underneath the paint on the airplane? They had a U.S. flag on the airplane, and the fatheads in Auckland proceeded to erase about a third or two thirds of it or something. They painted the whole airplane, didn't they? No. <clears throat> they painted the just unpainted. Oh. Was that your idea, or was that part of the master I plan? Know, I didn't know anything about it. I didn't even know it had been done. Oh, really? You'd think they would have asked me something about it. So you were essentially flying an airplane with no markings on it, is that right? As a tail marking, I don't mean in the military sense, but in the FAA sense. Yeah. The second person to greet me, right behind the this naval commandant, or Jess Reed from Cambridge, my old top. Oh, really? Who been in my class at this college. Wow. Yeah. He'd been instructing the pilots for the Dutch Air Force. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> he had us over to cocktails and first time sir and Rod Brown. Well there were some places uh where you could not get aviation gas, isn't that right? That was sort of bio. Mm. Right there. It's supposed to be a cash hundred octane for it. Instead there was some automobile gas. I think it was around seventy octane yeah. instead of a hundred. Well, Swig Roth the first engineer. pumped up all the fuel out of the sea wings and put it in the center tanks in the wing. <laughs> Knowing Sweet, I think he probably filled the sea wings with all the fuel gas. The only load we were carrying was a, an engine in its case <laughs> and a, a drum of oil. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, where was the minefield? At the entrance to the harbor. We taxied yeah. right through it. Yeah, well, he, he, they said bio? they hadn't been to, to help him in. Because, because of the, the minefield? minefield? Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> was that the only place where uh, you were not able to get uh, aviation fuel, at, just at Surabaya? Well, of course. The, Royal, the British Royal Air Force was using a hundred dollars which was fortunate for us because... When we took off from Surabaya on the 100 octane, we leveled off at a couple of thousand feet, pulled the power way back, cooled off the engines. When we turned on the automobile gas, <laughs> the engines almost jumped out of their mouths. I'll bet. <laughs> 30 octane difference was yeah. quite a stream. It was that or leave it for the Japs. Where did they fill the gas tanks? with five-gallon jugs or something. That was so funny. Every place except Brazil. They had to refuel it with yeah. jerry cans? Yeah. Yeah. Well, at Port Darwin, we had to refuel out of five gallons. That must have taken a while. But I was pretty tired. I went to bed. I was still refueling. And I point to stand up and did it. The roof was just so many people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Top of the wing. I was awakened by what I thought was a bombing wreck. Man, a bed shook. What a noise. It was just one of the local thunderstorms. <laughs> yeah. They draw some big ones out there, don't they? Well, the first <clears throat> official degree is Fort Darwin, which is apparently a, a ship.
gripping and stirring point was the wife of the United States Navy port director. We'd been in our clothes for a couple of days straight, and sleeping on the boats on the, on the chairs, and <laughs> we wanted a shower, so we asked this lady where we could get a shower. And you see that building over there next to the water tower? Well, you go over there. You go in and talk to the woman there. So we did. They were very gracious. Of course, their element on the flight crew started snickering and laughing. I said, what's so funny? I said, you, you know where we get our shower, don't you? And I said, yeah. I said, well, maybe you don't. The Australian Army brothel. <laughs> That's wonderful. <laughs> so we've been directed by the book, Second the You wrote in your letter uh, to me about the bank manager in Gladstone that opened the bank on a... Important <clears throat> point. I was leading up that. I thought we were all through, or going to be all through in an hour or two. This young man... Must have been, oh, he might have been 30. He came up to me and said, to, How are you fixed for money? I said, Well, we're broke because we had money to take us to New Zealand and back to San Francisco. But uh, we've been, uh, been gone about a month. Mm -hmm. He said, Well, I'll probably be shot for my pen. Today, or uh, Sunday, I'll go down to the bank. Well, well this was Saturday. Go in the morning and go down to the bank and open the time lock and I'll get you five hundred dollars US. Wow. We put the navigator Rod Brown in charge of charge of the money. The money and one reason is he was the only one who had a, a lock box and a key. Every issue of funds you had to sign a check for it. And he locked them in this navigation box. And did you finance the entire trip with that five hundred dollars? Yeah, but of course the RAF was billing the U.S. And, uh, but you were buying food as you went along? Yeah. yeah. That's what, what the, the person would sign up. Yeah. The stuff and, uh, Tell me about the Japanese submarine that you uh, between Surabaya and... We were, we were on the southwest side. <laughs> I forgot the name of the island. Right, just beyond. Sumatra? Sumatra. Well, why were we lucky? Well, ten days before, or something like that, the monsoon was supposed to have started. Sure. And it was late. But we had no charts. At Surabaya, we went aboard the cruiser Houston, who sunk a few weeks later. The crew was exhausted. They were sitting on the deck with their backs against the turrets, just mm. physically and nervously exhausted. The navigator, Rod Brown and I went and talked to the navigator who was a commander. He said, I'm sorry, I haven't got any charts except, except these ones and I have to keep these. So, of course, we hit about it. He said, I'll give you all these plotting charts. He gave us a raft of plotting charts. Well, we just take latitude and longitude on a boat it's for our destination and mm -hmm. where we thought we were and have at it. Well, we were counting our blessings on the weather. We got down under the upper clouds. And was it in uh, daylight? Yeah, it got to be daylight. We were due sometime within a, an hour, a portion of it, to hit our destination. There was some low scud. We get down below the scud because we didn't know just what kind of wind we'd been having all night. We didn't want to miss the island. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> and it was like this, and we were coming like this. Mm -hmm. And India's up there. Yeah. We you miss it on the wrong side, and there's an awful lot of water. What yeah. kind of situation for a flying boat we'd meet in India? All of a sudden, there it was, a Jap submarine, the small one. Jap crew was running for the deck gun, which was way up forward. Uh, we were busy getting into the scud again. <laughs> I dare say. <laughs> Getting as far away from that sub as we could. And all the while, these engines are running on automobile gas, is that right? Yeah. Did you have only your crew on board, or did you have. 
No, uh, uh, well, people. we had picked up a group, an uh, original group. We had picked up a company of meteorologists. Did they come with you from Auckland, or? No, we picked, I think we picked one of them up in New Mayo, mm -hmm. New Caledonia. And from time to time, we, I think we picked up a mechanic at Rockhampton. He was being moved to some other place because they were going to establish a, a route. Well, at one time we had 18 in the crew, <laughs> which just meant it was a little difficult to feed them all on the $500. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Were you able to get uh, aviation gas in, in Africa, in uh, Khartoum and in uh, yeah, Leopoldville? Yeah. Hmm. Karachi, Khartoum. That must have been quite a leg from uh, Leopoldville across the South Atlantic to... It, it wasn't very short. Brazil. It was about we were, 23 we were hours. We worried up with the fact that we got that far. We were out of the war zone. Yeah. And, uh, <clears throat> Then to be greeted by German agents that stole all your stuff out of the airplane. <laughs> well, the U.S. military attaché over at Leopoldville, the other side of the river, was Brazzaville. And the Rod Brown and Navigator was an Air Force Reserve. So this uh, military attaché gave him a shot about this long. He said, now, when you get to New York, I want you to leave immediately for Washington. Don't let anybody get their hands on this chart. Now, you're responsible. So we kept it locked up in the only place we could lock it. But when we went ashore in Brazil, they forced us off the airplane because they're going to spray for yellow fever. And they put two men on there, all it looked like looked like diver suits, oxygen supply. Yeah. And they helped, they sprayed it down. <clears throat> well, we were about an hour and a half out of there the next morning. Rod Brown said, "Well, they got into our strong box. And we got about, we got just a handful of chips left, and my chart is gone." Oh my God. <laughs> I don't know what he did about it. It wasn't my business. I wouldn't know, yeah. to know about it. He was a wonderful guy. The secret envelope that you got in San Francisco before you I left. don't know what happened to it. Uh, we weren't interested in, <coughs> but did, did in that... writing a history of it at that time. You know, if you'd done one of these things before, you'd know a lot of things <laughs> to, to do that would come in handy. Then. We were just interested in getting back yeah. In one piece because those jets were moving fast. Sure. I mean, we pulled, the reason we had to go that way is they pulled all our people out of Canton Island so there wasn't any water because no water evaporators. Mm -hmm. And we had no way of running the fuel. They probably sabotaged the pumps and everything and uh, against the Japanese. So the Japanese might have been sitting there when we got there. They, they didn't know where the Japs were. Yeah, I know. They did not know. Yeah, it moved awfully fast then. When we got into New York, the guy was the only one who slated to go back to the West Coast. And the rest of them were putting on the Atlantic room. This didn't suit <laughs> very well. I guess not. I had gotten out of there, so I was glad I didn't have to go back in there. So first of all, Captain Marshall, you are a great interviewer. <laughs> After 30 years, what what do you think of that? The thing that struck me is all they had was $500. Yeah, uh, but remember, $500 and $1940 is probably a little bit more than that now. And uh, as uh, uh, Bob said, the RAF billed uh, the U.S. government for the fuel and probably other things as well and uh given the part of the world that they were flying in they you could probably eat for, for pretty little <laughs> i had forgotten that uh, they had picked up some extra people in uh, mm -hmm. Numea. i know gene dunning uh, got on in Numea, and there was a mechanic i didn't realize that they had other p people 
Uh, besides that, yeah, I remember he said they had, at one point, they had 18 people on the crew. <clears throat> so, but they were just, you know, it was, uh, it was, it was, it was fly by night. They, they, they were making things up as they went along. They had no idea what they were going to encounter at the next stop, whether there'd be aviation gas available, what, uh, they had the engine failure going out of uh, Trincomalee on the way to Karachi with a, about an hour and a half after takeoff. And the, they blew a cylinder on the number three engine and they had to go back. That was Christmas Day, I think, in 1941. They had to go back um, to Trincomalee and uh, repair it themselves. And uh, fortunately, the entire British fleet was anchored in Trincomalee Harbor, including... Uh, some big heavy ships that had their own uh, their own machine shop. So they were able to avail themselves with some Royal Navy help, you know, in that respect. So, yeah, it was, <laughs> I, I, it's something that would never happen today it, it would, for, you know, a great many reasons. But it's such a piece of history. And I was just delighted that I was able to meet with Ford before he died and find him so alert and interesting and provided such a tremendous narrative, which is what I ended up writing about. Any closing thoughts for our listeners on why Robert Ford's life and why this historical event of the long way home after Pearl Harbor is important? Well, it's part of, it's a part of history. You know, if you can't remember history, you're condemned to repeat it. And that's, that, uh, it's just part of aviation lore. It's, mm -hmm. uh, and I'm just proud and, and humbled that, uh, that I was in a position to be, uh, be a small part of it and being able to talk to, uh, to Kevin Ford. And to my knowledge, uh, and I've been researching Panium history for some time, I have never come across a recording of Robert Ford. So if there are recordings out there, there are few. So it is just such a delight to have it on this program. Yeah, I would venture to say that yeah, probably without contradiction that it's probably the only one. And it's just, again, it it's such a delight to be able to hear someone from history uh, living through these historical events, um, it's like a time capsule, and uh, and that's yeah. what this program is about. And you and I serve on the the Pan Am Museum board together, and that's what our organization's about: uh, preserving this kind of history. And it's just been such a delight. Thanks very much for inviting me on and uh, letting me share this story. All right. Well, thank you, and again, thank you for sharing your thirty year old interview with Captain Ford from 1994 when he was 88 years old, just shortly before he passed away. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Take care. Thanks. Pan Am was a pioneer in air travel and still stands as one of the most iconic and innovative airlines in aviation history. That legacy lives on at the Pan Am Museum in Garden City, New York, where you can explore the rich history of the aircrafts and individuals at the heart of the company known as the world's most experienced airline. For more information about the Pan Am Museum, check out our website at www.thepanammuseum.org. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok. As was once a tagline in one of our commercials, we would greatly appreciate your support to help the Pan Am Museum continue making the going great. You can also support the museum by shopping on our online store for all things Pan Am, accessories, apparel, jewelry, books, models, and posters. We want to hear from you. If you have a question for us or want to share your story, our email address is podcast at the Pan Am Museum .org. As flight crews once said to passengers departing for their destinations around the world, thank you for flying, Pan Am. Mm -hmm.